Rachel Sennis, and welcome to Inside Santa Barbara, the news magazine that takes you inside the city's most important projects, issues, and events. Today we are coming to you from De La Guerra Plaza, where Old Spanish Days Fiesta is taking place. You can stroll through this colorful mercado and feast on great food, shop for crafts and souvenirs, and enjoy live entertainment all day long. Fiesta is part of Santa Barbara history. The event is in its 82nd year. This November, another piece of history will be added to Santa Barbara when the city hosts its first ever standalone election. We bring you all the details in our top story. November is fast approaching, and that means election time. But 2007 marks a significant year for the city of Santa Barbara. For the first time ever, the city will hold its own election instead of the county. At the city's request, the county um, presented the city with a cost estimate related to conducting the city's 2007 election. That cost estimate was between $550,000 and $650,000. Um, in comparison, the county of Ventura estimates the cost to conduct the city of Ventura's election to be approximately $95,000 for a comparable election with a higher number of registered voters. With savings of over $300,000 of city general fund money, the city wants to maintain the same level of service to the community as in past years. To make sure this election is successful, the city has contracted with Martin and Chapman Company to help with election logistics and has also hired an elections consultant. The most important task for the city is reaching out to voters. Essentially, we are going to mimic exactly what the county is doing. That is our goal. We are working closely with the county and, um, and trying to get the exact same polling locations, and we're doing our best to, to try to make the process as seam seamless as possible. The city wants the public to know that although it is running this election, the only difference voters will find on Election Day is how they vote. Under this election, voters will fill out a ballot and drop it in a ballot box instead of voting electronically like in past years. Although this may seem old-fashioned, it is the same process used by all other cities in California that run their own elections. Some community members hope this historic standalone election will help pave the way for future elections. Another way the city is making sure this election runs smoothly is by recruiting poll workers and inspectors. Well, I became interested working for as a poll worker because uh, the city was looking for volunteers and I thought that with my experience working at the county elections office that it could be used here for the city. She's provisional ballot type 5. Poll workers and inspectors are required to train with the city in November. For those who have a lot of experience working behind the scenes on election day, they say the experience is rewarding. The uh, work during the day itself is strenuous, although sometimes we're very, very busy trying to take care of things. Uh, an inspector's job is a little different from the regular poll workers in that uh, when new problems occur, it's our responsibility to figure out how to do those properly, how to solve those problems. And I find that very interesting for me personally. I think it's a good opportunity for people in the community to get involved. It's a very um, lengthy process, but it's also very informative. And I think that once people um, find out or get more involved in it and see what it takes to run an election and what is involved in an election, that people will have probably more respect for it and probably want to vote more. According to the county, in 2006, just over 30,000 people cast ballots in the city election. That's about a 69% voter turnout. This year, the city is encouraging Santa Barbans to exercise their democratic rights. Well, I think voting is important because that's how change comes about. It's something that whether you want to see change in the city or if you don't want to see change in the city, one way to get your feelings about that across is by voting. In a democracy, uh, we choose our leaders. And each individual voter may not get the result he wanted, but he's part of it. And if they don't vote, they're abdicating their responsibility and their privilege. So mark your calendar and remember these important dates. Sample ballots are scheduled to go out between September 27th and October 16th. Permanent absentee ballots will be mailed October 8th. If you'd like to register for a permanent absentee ballot, it is not too late. Call the county elections office at 568-2200. The last day to register to vote is October 22nd. 
You can still request an absentee ballot for this election. You have until October 30th. For that, you can call the city clerk's office at 564-5309. And of course, election day is Tuesday, November 6th. Election day is also the last day the city clerk's office can receive absentee voter ballots. Vote and be a part of democracy as well as history in the city's first ever standalone election this November. Voters will be voting on the election of three council members because of this less costly election. The city has placed a charter amendment on the November ballot that would switch voting from odd years to even years and rejoin the state, federal, and county elections. For more information, go to sbcityvote.org. Well, we are now at Casa de la Guerra, which was the social hub of Santa Barbara when it was first built in the 1800s. Weddings and other events have been held here throughout the years. This was the site where everyone gathered for the very first Fiesta in 1924. It is still part of Fiesta festivities today. Well, imagine taking an afternoon stroll, walking your dog, or shopping downtown without a sidewalk. It may be hard to imagine, but there are areas in the city without them, and they're called missing links. In our next story, we go inside a program that aims to create sidewalks in those missing links to improve pedestrian access. On a warm summer day, children hand out fresh lemonade on San Inez Street near Cleveland Elementary School. Thank you very much. Here, a lot of activity is taking place, like crews working hard to lay down the foundation of a new sidewalk. We're standing on uh, San Inez Street at Carpinteria, and behind me we have some people working on the sidewalk infill program. They've already completed the excavating and the grading to create a clear space for the future sidewalk. And it looks like they've set up the forms to pour the concrete in the next couple of days. The project is part of an ongoing program called Missing Links, locations throughout the city where sections of sidewalk are missing. Santa Barbara has about 600 missing links citywide. That adds up to about 120 miles of sidewalk. In 1999, the city set up a program to prioritize those links to improve pedestrian access. They were prioritized using seven different criteria. If the location is on the way to a school, if there is a beaten path where people are already walking, if there is access to a park, if it's a short length, if there is potential to link pedestrians to a major destination, whether the location gives access to transit, and the traffic volume in relation to the missing link. This link here at San Inez and Clifton Streets is important because it services Cleveland Elementary School and gives access to this hill, which is a pedestrian-only route. Across the street, we see the new full sidewalk, which allows students to get to school safely. A positive change now that children do not and should not have to share the road with cars. This is my spot here and I'm here all the time. You think it's, but, safe? You think it's safer so they don't have to walk on the... Yeah, it's safer uh, for the kids to have sidewalks, I know. The program also conforms to requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act. We're trying to make the best design for all of our street users and our sidewalk users. Wherever we're designing and constructing sidewalk near an intersection, we're also putting in ramps not only where the sidewalk is, but across the street where we're leading the pedestrian with our new sidewalk. New sidewalks not only affect pedestrian access, but property values as well. But studies show that property values actually increase after sidewalk is installed. And even those people who have a hard time with new sidewalk coming into their, their neighborhood, they, they actually feel really supportive of the project once it's underway and they are more familiar with it. We constructed some sidewalk with a Safe Routes to School grant a few years ago over by the Harding School, and it was really wonderful to see the change in behavior that resulted as a result of that new sidewalk. Whereas before, parents and their children had been walking on the street to get to Harding School. With this project, they were able to move off the street and into, onto the sidewalk separated from the traffic volumes. The Missing Links project happens once a year in the summer. With 600 to 700 missing links, the entire project would take 60 years to complete if construction prices remained constant. The sidewalk infill project has been funded by Safe Routes to School, regional funds through SB CAG, and Measure D. 
But if a reauthorization of Measure D doesn't pass in the future, the city will have to find another way to fund the Missing Links project. When missing links are no longer missing, the community sees the difference. It's better and safer for the kids to walk, and there's less mud for the kids when it rains, and it looks better, and this is a better environment for our kids. A happy thought giving parents and these children something to smile about. This year, the city constructed about a mile of missing links. Next year, a quarter of that is expected to be designed and constructed. Well, along with the Presidio and the Old Mission, Casa de la Guerra is one of the remnants of Santa Barbara's Spanish heritage. It was built in the 1820s by Jose de la Guerra, the first Presidio Commandant. In 1874, the first city hall was built across the street. Inside City Hall today, employees are engaging in sustainable practices. City employees are no longer purchasing single-use bottles of water for meetings and events. Channel 18's Dominique Blocker tells us why the choice between drinking tap water over bottled water is becoming more clear. Would you be willing to spend more than 1,000 times as much money to guarantee that your water was fresh and clean? What if you found out that buying expensive bottles of water only guaranteed that you were increasing dangerous emissions and adding to our already overflowing landfills? The city of Santa Barbara decided that with healthy and safe drinking water available straight from the tap, it would no longer purchase bottles of water for meetings and events. With over 1,500 employees and multiple meetings and events each week, cutting back on bottled water purchases will save time, money, and help the environment. Generally, I would drive to the closest place possible, but still I had to drive it was Smart and Final, which is about three blocks away. So it was always a car trip. For the last two years, the city's been working to do zero waste events. All of our internal events, we've actually been able to eliminate trash cans. We just have recycling and zero waste compostable containers. One of the big elements of that now is reducing our use of water bottles. We're pretty much just going to be producing compostable materials, which you can actually use right here in Santa Barbara as compost. In the United States, more than 30 billion bottles of water were sold last year. With only a shocking 10 to 15 percent of those bottles being recycled, a huge amount of waste is being added to our landfills. In California alone, over 3 million recyclable water bottles are thrown away every day. And about 100 percent of the plastic that goes into producing the water bottles is virgin plastic. There's almost no recycled content. So we realize when we're recycling those bottles, even the ones we do get, we actually can't use them to make new water bottles. They have to be downcycled instead of recycled and used to think, produce things like trash cans, uh, recycled plastic furniture, and decking. Most bottled water has a tremendous amount of embodied energy. Embodied energy is the amount of energy and resources it takes to make a product and then get it to the point of consumption. Take Fiji water, for example. To get one bottle to your home, materials for the plastic bottles are shipped to Fiji burning fossil fuels. Energy is then consumed to make the bottles. The water is then bottled, loaded onto ships that burn more fuel, and shipped 5,500 miles across the ocean to Los Angeles. The bottles are loaded onto trucks and trains, all powered by fossil fuels. They are then loaded onto other trucks and driven to grocers across the country, including those in Santa Barbara. This process creates a lot of pollution and adds enormous quantities of global warming CO2 emissions to the atmosphere. And Fiji water isn't the only culprit. Nearly one-fourth of bottled water sold in the U.S. crosses national borders by boat, train, airplane, and truck. So why are consumers enticed by the exotic ads and fancy claims made by bottled water companies? How bad would it be for us to just drink water from our city's taps? The answer is not bad at all. The city of Santa Barbara's water regularly meets or exceeds federal regulations and state regulations as prescribed by the Environmental Protection Agency in the State Department of Health Services. Because bottled water companies are monitored by the Food and Drug Administration and not the Environmental Protection Agency, there are more than 20 contaminants that must be monitored in city tap water that do not have to be inspected in bottled water. 
FDA rules for bottled water are generally less strict than tap water regulations. The city's water is processed at the Cater Water Treatment Plant. Water clarity and all chemical levels, including disinfectant levels, are constantly monitored. I thought it would be interesting to test a bottle of water I had brought to the Cater Water Treatment Plant. Comparing my bottled water to the city's tap water, we measured the clarity. See how smart that water is. <laughs> Although this is not the only test for water quality, I was shocked to find that my pure vapor distilled water was less clear than what flows out of Cater. Another startling fact, roughly 40% of bottled water begins as tap water. These brands simply put regular tap water through an additional filter, then bottle and ship it to consumers. So then, why the distinct taste of the city's municipal water? The high mineral content in the water has a taste in the water that many people don't find appealing, so that's why they often opt buy bottled water. If you're not thrilled about the taste of our tap water, there are simple filters that can remove the minerals. Then, grab a reusable water bottle and fill up knowing you are conserving energy, reducing pollution, and saving money and we crunched the numbers. If you switch to drinking just one liter of city tap water instead of buying a bottle each day, you can save over $500 each year. Well, Casa Delaguerra is made out of adobe, an ancient sustainable material that is getting a lot of renewed attention by home builders today. Adobe is available locally and is a good insulator that can help save a lot of money. Well, up next, City TV's Brooke Hawkins shows us a modern day approach to conserve energy. After one of the driest years on record, some Santa Barbara residents are doing their part to help conserve water. By participating in the Save Water, Save a Buck rebate program, local businesses and residents will soon be saving more than water on their next water bill. The city is offering rebates for residents and business owners. There are rebates available for toilets, clothes washers, urinals, and a lot of other devices. The rebates range from $100 to $350, depending on the um, product that's being rebated. Thanks to funding from the state, county, and city, water customers can save money and help the environment. The city's water rebate program is open to both commercial and residential customers in the city of Santa Barbara. These two groups can apply to receive rebates when they replace their existing water guzzling toilets and washers with new high efficiency appliances. With the city rebate, um, yeah, made it uh, made it pretty easy to do it, pretty palatable because they were now com com comparable to what I had spent. I don't know how many years ago when I redid fixtures last time, so it uh, was it was pretty painless. After purchasing qualifying models of toilets, urinals, or clothes washers, customers simply have to fill out the rebate application that is available at sbwater.org. We've gotten some feedback from customers that have participated in the rebate program and they are really happy with it. The couple of the uh, laundromats in town have retrofitted all of their clothes washers and they're saving a significant amount of money on not only on their water bill but the sewer bill also because the sewer bill is based on the amount of your water usage and your, of course, energy bill too. Thanks to the rebates, many local businesses are seeing large savings on their monthly bill. The average is a 9% decrease in water consumption. There's so many sources of use. Uh, you know, clearly we have dishwashing and other issues uh, that we use water for, but uh, uh, I believe my water usage is down year to date. Uh, we did have the old low flow toilets in before I remodeled, but these are even more efficient and, and, and the technology has gotten better. Local laundromat Bubbles and Beans added 20 new high-efficiency washers, a change that has decreased the business's average monthly consumption by 20%, which adds up to a savings of nearly $700 a month, in addition to the $3,000 from rebates. The Save Water, Save a Buck rebate program is just one part of the City Water Department's efforts to help conserve water for Santa Barbara. The water that we're saving today extends the life of the lakes and reservoirs and allows us to have more water for those dry years, like this year. If we continue into dry years, then the more water we're saving up front, the more we'll have to carry us through those floods. 
For more information about the Save Water, Save a Buck rebate program, log on to santabarbaraca.gov slash water. Well, Casa de la Guerra is a great example of the value this community puts on preserving our cultural heritage. Well, over the years, Santa Barbans have shown that they also cherish their open space. At no time were those values more apparent than 10 years ago when the fate of one of Santa Barbara's most beloved spaces was minutes away from being lost forever. Van Tu explains. In the stress of everyday life, sometimes we just need to get away from it all. Luckily, with the abundance of city parks in Santa Barbara, you don't need to travel far to find a piece of land to gain some peace of mind. The Douglas Family Preserve is one such getaway. Located on the Mesa, it remains one of the few unspoiled coastal spaces in Santa Barbara, where breathtaking ocean views and 70 acres of native plants have won the hearts of residents and visitors alike. The coast of Florida has completely almost been taken over by commercial development and there's very few places where with or without your dog you can walk, um, mm -hmm. so it's a very special place. The preserve, formerly known as the Wilcox property, would not be the oasis it is today if not for the efforts of thousands of residents ten years ago. A developer was poised to build on the property, but community members wanted to preserve it as open space. The property owner agreed to sell for three and a half million dollars. The only catch? It needed to be raised in just three months. Donations large and small poured in from benefits, bake sales, marathons, and even children sending in jars of coins. The preserve got its new name from local actor Michael Douglas, who gave the last $600,000 needed to seal the deal. At the moment of signing, it was uh, just a few minutes left in the deadline, and the uh, would-be purchasers that had hoped that the, this deal wouldn't go through were there to grab it. It was a very tense moment. <laughs> there were few people more instrumental to the campaign than Sue and Jim Higman. I was the local treasurer to obtain the money to purchase it from the pension fund. Over 7,000 people were donors. We're very lucky that what we were trying to save, other people felt that way too. So it wasn't too difficult. As you stroll through the beautiful property, you'll stumble across pieces of history that show how community members can make a difference. Like this curb, which was meant for a large housing development here at the Douglas Family Preserve. I'm very happy that people recognize what we've saved, what it's good for, and how it can best be used and not abused, used but not abused. And uh, I think this kind of attitude must continue. Today, that attitude is still strong. On this 10th anniversary of the preserve, Scape, the Southern California artist painting for the environment, along with Park, the Parks and Recreation Community Foundation, are raising money for the maintenance of the Douglas Family Preserve. It's a great community collaboration. Half of the proceeds will go to benefit the Douglas Family Preserve. The artists were putting in just hours and hours of mostly on site, a lot of on site. We drag all our stuff out there and we set it up and we we're in the wind blowing away off the cliffs, but we are really happy to be able to do that. Quiet retreat, nature spot, training grounds, or a place to unleash your inner puppy. Whatever the Douglas Family Preserve is to you, above all, it is a testament to the perseverance and dedication of a community that understands the immeasurable value of open spaces. My kids grew up there and were able to play there. We just love walking out there, seeing the sunset, watching the whales, walking our dog, I mean, seeing our neighbors, watching every other kid grow up. It's uh, more uh, not a manicured park, not 
with the lawns and the sprinklers and benches and I think that most of the people appreciate that fact. The fact that it's unspoiled, that it's, it may have a few trails to get from place to place, but it's not, it's not a thing you be there in high-heeled shoes and all that stuff. Natural. That's the word, natural. If you want to learn more on how you can help Santa Barbara's parks, visit our website, citytv18.com. Well, Fiesta is just one of the city's many cultural events. Since the mid-1980s, festivals at Oak Park have attracted thousands of people to the city. Up next, City TV's Christy Zwicky takes us to Oak Park to a festival with great food, dancing, and a celebration of everything French. <laughs> Berets and baguettes invaded Santa Barbara once again for the French festival held over Bastille Day weekend at Oak Park. Now in its 20th year, the festival celebrates all things French with plenty of ooh la la. This is the largest French celebration in the western United States. So they have sort of a real unusual treasure in their backyard without even realizing it. Also because it is such a unique event, many people come from all around California and beyond just to come to the French Festival. It's every country that's represented uh, that speaks French as a first or second language. So you have Vietnam, you have Africa, you have Morocco, you have Tahiti, you have uh, Cajun, okay, which are all French based, and so all the food all the entertainment, all the literature, the clothing is all represented here today. Among the 20,000 participants, you can always spot Wade Van Tetten, who does the festival's security as a gendarme. It's a role that has kept him coming back for 17 years. Steve finds me wherever I'm in the world. And I was served in the U.S. military, and uh, he would contact my wife, who is French, and say, make Wade available, and make sure Wade's available for the French festival. And so I would take leave from the military just to come home and do this. Like tourists flocking to the Eiffel Tower, foodies come from all over to sample the bounty of French treats and catch up with the delightful vendors. Almost each family has escargot from uh, appetizer. We get the escargot from Europe and we prepare in a white wine sauce with uh, persil and we just uh, add the bollor and garlic. I am a baker, my son was a baker, and I wanted to come from France, I never did, so I keep going to do a French croissant, chocolate croissant, almond croissant, everything typical, really French. Here at the French festival, it can be really hard to choose what to eat. This year I thought it'd be different and forgo my usual crepe for escargot or snails. Everyone claims that they're the best thing here, but I've actually never had snails before, so I'm going to give it a shot. So until next year, we bid abiento to crepes and snails and anxiously await the return of our French friends. And uh, everybody from Santa, from Santa Barbara should be happy we here. For more information on the event, go to FrenchFestival.com. Well, that does it for this month's episode of Inside Santa Barbara and our trip to Old Spanish Days Fiesta. If you have any questions or comments about our show, give us a call at City TV at 564 5311 or catch us on our website, citytv18.com. I'm your host, Rachel Senes, and remember to get involved inside Santa Barbara.